Welcome back to Live from the Heartland, the early fall edition. Um, for those of you out in the suburbs, had a little frost last night. We did not here in the city. Um, tomorrow, uh, one of our good friends, I mean Monday, one of our good friends is uh, putting, uh, putting together something called Suffering from Sugar Blues. Uh, and she's uh, offering a free lecture uh, at the Rogers Park Library Monday night, 6 p.m., to 7.30 p.m. That's Anita Sims, who is a health coach, also uh, married to the great coach uh, some of you have uh, worked under over at Loyola Park for many years. Coach Clive. Coach Clive, uh, yes. And so Anita Sims, Sugar Blues, Monday night at the Rogers Park Library over there on Clark Street and Morse Avenue. We'll have more announcements as we come through, but we now have... Did you want to have an announcement, Michael? I... Uh, I did. Okay, then. I wanted to let people know that uh, next week we're going to have, among other people, we're going to have uh, Chris Burke and probably Pat Gleason from the Salcedo Press. And oh, for good. over 40 years, they have been uh, printing beautiful graphics and information for progressive causes and cultural causes. And they have a 40-year retrospective uh, that's up here on the wall at the I Heartland. I love it. It's so and beautiful. It's, it is very inspiring during this election time. And there will be a, a, a gathering on Sunday the 14th, 3 to 6, and uh, also a closing on, uh, on the 9th, Friday the 9th. So come and see this exhibit. Uh, whether you're coming here to eat or you're coming here to drink or to hear music or just walking by, uh, come on over and check out these posters. Uh, I'm really happy to say that uh, uh, I have a, uh, another relative uh, who's here, uh, my niece Caitlin Parton, who... Uh, has been very active over the years in a number of things, and she went to the University of Chicago and then went off to, uh, uh, to the, back to the East Coast. And uh, why don't you just say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, to be here. Caitlin. And what brings you to Chicago this time? Well, I wanted to enjoy a long weekend in a city that I've grown to love and see family and friends who are here. We have a lot of friends from college who ended up moving back here and I did some studying in my old University of Chicago library yesterday and I might go back down there and get some um, old undergrad good vibes to take back with me to law school. Well, let's, I'm going to share with everybody that you were, uh, when you were a kid, you got meningitis, and you were the youngest uh, person on the planet to get the cochlear implant. That's and, true. And uh, would wow. you share a little bit about that? And basically what I'm after is how that kind of led you in the direction of becoming uh, a, now a, a law student and also someone who's interned and worked with uh, various government agencies uh, around the rights of people with disabilities. Um, when I was 18 months old, I lost my hearing to meningitis. It was misdiagnosed as the flu. And as a result, I became profoundly deaf. And at the time, um, there was a new device called the cochlear implant. It was an FDA investigative status. My parents were raising me in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, which at the time was not the safest neighborhood. And doctors said, well, maybe she'll be able to hear dogs barking, car horns honking, maybe her name being called. And that sounded pretty good to them. So they took a gamble and decided to get the implant for me. And it's gone far above and beyond those very low initial expectations. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a wonderful tool for me. I grew up doing speech therapy and auditory training. It's a lot of work. I don't hear perfectly at all, but it's really helped me go much farther than I think I would have without it. And so in turn, we became advocates um, to educate people about the cochlear implant and what it can do. It's not a cure at all. I take it off. I'm profoundly deaf. I've learned sign language later in my life. Um, it's not trying to change deaf culture. It's really just a tool to help people get access to education and whatever else they would like to do with life. That was an issue for a while. Is that uh, I know your mom worked for uh, the League for the Hard of Hearing, and uh, she was basically attacked by the deaf community for Absolutely. giving you the cochlear implant. And you're, you're telling us now that it is a tool. And I guess that criticism has kind of gone away a little bit. 
Well, initially, it certainly was a threat to the deaf community. Right. You know, it really was seen as a, taking away a whole part of life. You know, um, a lot of people within the deaf community feel like deafness is not a disability. Um, they have their own wonderful culture and beautiful language, um, and the cochlear implant was seen as really taking that away completely. But over the last 20 years, people have seen, you know what, it's really just a more high-tech hearing aid, and plenty of people within the deaf community wear hearing aids. More people within the deaf community are getting cochlear implants for themselves and letting their children choose to have it if they desire it. So it's really changed. Yeah, it really has. And there were, there were periods, I think we had Melody on this program uh, one did. time talking about it. She, uh, when she was in the throes of the struggle, um, and God love you both for being pioneers to the extreme. And your dad, Steve, too. And your dad, of course. <laughs> um, and you've now, as you study to be an attorney, um, to what extent is your work around uh, the American with Disabilities Act and uh, how that's developed after maybe, how long has that been in effect? 20 some 30 years maybe. Uh, yeah, and the ADA? Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. 90, yeah. Okay. And um, there still needs, uh, there, there's still work to be done. Sure. Um, over the last uh, few years or so, the Supreme Court made a series of rulings that really limited the scope of who the Americans with Disabilities Act should apply to. When it was passed, the goal was that this really should help everybody, all right. Americans, you know, like it or not, everyone is temporarily abled, as um, John Hockenberry, a journalist for NPR, has said. And the ADA was seen as a safety net meant to protect everyone. And so the Supreme Court, over time, decided it shouldn't apply to people with diabetes, it shouldn't apply to people with AIDS, it shouldn't apply to people who are perceived as having disabilities. Um, and in 2008, Senate passed the restoration of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and really tried to restore the scope of the safety net. Huh, of I didn't the know, ADA. I did not know that. Um, so the, did they successfully restore the scope to apply to those groups you just described? Yes. And and when you say folks who appear to have disabilities, I mean, uh, that's in a city this size and in our neighborhood, we have, you know, thank God, some services for people who need help. Um, widespread, we have a lot of people who need help. Um, I don't know if ADA uh, actually speaks to um, the disability that is addiction, for example. I, th I think it's the biggest disability out there. As a city dweller, the people who are um, completely uh, slaves to alcohol or drugs have no ability to get past that until they get the help they need. And it's also one of the areas we have the least help in this city. Haymarket, well, and one it's of the, the only place that, that people can go. That we've noticed over the years is that people who are who are challenged in many ways. Uh, you know, they used to have, have institutions and places that theoretically help people, but they forced everyone onto the street. That's right. And uh, it's, it's, it's an ongoing issue, the homelessness question and uh, the degree of, uh, of challenges that folks have is really amazing. Yeah, you know, we're both thinking of the same person right now. We are. I, we are. Uh, A gal uh, who Caitlin we're... Parton, uh, you, uh, I remember you had an internship with Senator Harkin. Uh, you then worked for a law firm that uh, that really handled some uh, some great civil rights cases, and most recently you worked for the Justice Department, uh, which uh, you know we we look at them sometimes critically, but we also are appreciative of some of the great things that they've done. Uh, tell us about your experience working in Washington and with these organizations. I was interning with the special litigation section within the Civil Rights Division, and it was. A really fascinating experience um, because the Civil Rights Division, you know, as you know, has a good history of protecting the rights of all Americans um, and their civil rights. The special litigation section focuses on the rights of people who are institutionalized, people with mental illness who are in prison, the rights of women to access reproductive health clinics. Um, so it was really a fascinating experience wow. for me. 
Um, I went to some really interesting lectures. Attorney General Eric Holder spoke to the intern class, and so did um, Assistant Attorney General Tom Perez. And, you know, we certainly asked both of them challenging questions. You know, why are we still in Guantanamo Bay? What about the rights of those people? And How'd they handle that? Oh, like politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it, it was an interesting mix of it's the, it's the Justice Department, and they also do white-collar stuff and protect the government um, from, you know... <laughs> people trying to get them to do the right thing. But within the Civil Rights Division, I was really impressed with the work that they're doing in education, representing people with disabilities, making sure that prisons are not resorting to automatically placing people in isolation just because they have no idea how to provide services for people with mental illness or mental health issues. Wow. So. Good work. Uh, well, Good let me, work, Kate. One last question. Uh, we'll get to talk to you a lot more this weekend, I hope, although I know you and Robin will be running around. Uh, you are at CUNY in New York, uh, and you are involved in the Disability Project uh, in New York, and you also uh, are on a campus where there is now a challenge going on uh, around some issues of access to buildings, etc. Can you share the, the current struggle you're involved with? Well, um, as a pioneer throughout my life, I'm often the first person who has to force people to follow the law and make um, their school accessible. And that's unfortunate, but I guess it's the role I've been placed in in life. And Relish it. <laughs> so uh, we just moved into a new building, and we have a co-op agreement with Citibank, who is our big, big neighbor who's kindly letting us use their brand new building, but the building is not accessible for people with disabilities, and so we're agitating and trying to get them to change it and make it accessible. They could afford it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Caitlin, partner, is there anything you'd like to share with people, things that uh, keep on their radar, uh, things they should know about? Well, I think if you're interested in learning more about disability rights issues and making sure your um, life is accessible. If you're a business owner, there are really easy changes that you can make that don't cost money. Um, hire people with disabilities. You can raise tables with just a couple of concrete blocks so someone with a wheelchair can roll right in and work for you. So keep an open mind. Check out ADA.gov. They have a really helpful checklist to make sure you're up on everything. Uh, we've had a neighbor, uh, I, I want to say her name, uh, Ms. Mott, and she, uh, she really uh, challenged us here at the Heartland on making sure that people could use the facilities, etc. And uh, as much as I was a little grumbly at the time, I was also grateful. And uh, between... Uh, Talk about a pioneer. She's a pioneer, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to have you in town, Caitlin Parton. We look forward to all the good work that you're going to do. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you Let's for have all, a big round of all the good you for have Caitlin. done. Thank you. And Jay, give us another quick tune, and we'll be right back with Koya Paz and talk to her about her new play. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.